Okay, we're looking in section 3.3, .3, and I want to show you how to use the statistical calculator to calculate the mean and standard deviation, um, both for sample or population and for both raw data and group data. So we've been looking at how to do that by hand and using tables and even using the calculator to assist us a little bit in making the table. This is going to be different. This is looking at having the calculator essentially take over and do all the work for us. So let's look at this first example. One year's monthly electric bills in dollars for a family living in the southeast are as follows. Use your calculator to find the mean and standard deviation. And I, I'm going to pause right there for a second. When they say use the calculator to find the mean and standard deviation, we actually don't know what kind they mean. That could be sample mean and sample standard deviation, or it could be population mean and population standard deviation. So let's read on. We are only using the results to describe the year's bills. So we have all 12 months of the year, and they're only trying to describe the year's bills. So this is not a sample. We have our entire data set of interest. So I would say this is a population. So I think that's worth noting before we even get to any of the calculator stuff. This line right here implies that what we're working with is a population. And that means that when they ask us to find the mean and standard deviation, they're asking us to find the population mean mu and the population standard deviation sigma. Now typically we would do that by starting to make a table, but in this section I want to show you how we can use the calculator to get there much quicker. So all we're actually going to write down on this problem is just answers. So most of this is just something that you would watch and try and follow along. So the first thing is I want to enter that data into the calculator. So I'm going to hit the stat button. Let me go ahead and raise this up, I guess you can see that. So I'm pressing the stat button right here, and then I'm choosing the edit menu. I probably have some data in here, so I'll use the arrow keys to go up and highlight the list name. Press clear, that'll make this part empty. Down arrow accepts that, and I have a blank list. So now I'm going to just type in my data. Let me move this down so I can see the data values. 77, 81, and so on. After each value, you can either press enter or the down arrow. Either one works. One of the first checks on your data entry that you want to do is just make sure you got the right amount of data. I finished entering my data and I'm on a blank line and it's saying that would be the 13th value in L1 if I was to do another one. And I had 12 pieces of data, so that's a good sign. I can even arrow up and say, see, this one is the last one is the 12th value. So I've entered the right number of values, and I'll show you how to check that I don't have any typos in that as we move on to the next step. So here's where in the past we'd start finding sums and using the other columns, but what I'm going to do here is have the calculator finish off the job. And so let me move this up so you can see the buttons again. I'm going to press the stat button, and this time instead of edit, which we've been doing, I'm going to move over to calc. That's not calculus, that's calculations. It's going to make some calculations for us. We have one variable here, it's the electric bills, and we're going to choose one variable statistics because of that. So it's already highlighted, so I'm just going to press enter. And then it needs to know where the data is. I only have data in L1, but the calculator doesn't look at things like that. It, it kind of insists that we would tell it where our data is. So move this for a second. Above the one key we see the L1. So I'm going to hit second and L1 so that I'm telling the calculator I have one variable, I want statistics for that, and the data is in L1. And when I do that, I get all the answers I need. There's still a matter of decoding it, and there's also the matter of making sure I entered in the data right. When I'm asking you to do a problem using the calculator, I'll give you the sum of the x squareds, and you'll see that that's part of the output as well. We're actually not going to use that number to do any calculations, but the calculator does use it internally. I'm giving you this so you can check. If this number matches that number and you have the right number of data values, 12, then you can be confident that you've entered every value, that you don't have any typos. It is theoretically possible you could have typos and this would still match, but it's really hard to do. And very unusual that you would make a mistake and that would still match. So when you see that, you can feel confident you've entered your data correctly. All right, so we want the mean and standard deviation. We've decided that this is population data, so we want mu and sigma. And I see sigma right here. They label it as an x, but we just put a sigma. That's in case you had multiple variables, an x and a y. You'll, you would have a sigma for your x's, a sigma for your y's. 
Um, since we don't have multiple variables, we'll just refer to it as sigma. And so that's going to be 42.214 if I go out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 digits. And I'm going to round there, so I'm going to say approximately. So let me write that one down. I'm going to move this over a little bit. So sigma is approximately 42.214. So certainly that's a lot faster, quicker, easier than the stuff that we were doing on the previous pages where we were making the tables and doing all the individual calculations ourselves. And we want the mean as well. And you can search. There's even arrow that says there's more stuff down, and I can scroll down, but I'm not going to find mu down there anywhere. So the calculator calculates two kinds of standard deviations, sample and population. And when we know what kind of data we have, when we determine its population data, we pick sigma, and then we write that one down. For the mean, it only calculates one kind, x bar, for the sample mean. But how does it do that? It adds up the 12 values and it divides by 12. And if we were doing a population mean, how would we do it? We would add up the 12 values and divide by 12. So even though it's not calling this mu, since this is population data, the kind of mean that applies really is mu. So they've labeled it as x bar, but we know better. We know this was population data. So we would write that down and say 106.67 and we would know that it was the mean because we know this is, or the population mean because we know this is population data. As far as the rounding rule there goes, the original data was whole numbers, so you're good at just one decimal place. But this is money, so I always feel a little strange stopping at one decimal place, which would be the nearest dime. It feels more natural to me to go out to the nearest penny. So that's it, um, and that would be our whole answer on that one. We've entered in our data. We uh, Cho chose statistics, one variable statistics, data in L1. They gave us the output. We found the two pieces we need. This one was right there for us. That one was there, but they had called it X bar, and we just had to know better and say, no, this is population data. We should refer to it as mu. And just a quick comment, they do that because it's more common for sam or it's more common for us to have a sample than a census. So it's more common for us to be computing a sample mean than a population mean. So they decided to label that as X bar because they figured that's what we would have more often. Just a, a quick comment. This is done with the answer, but the choices after we got all of our data in, um, we pressed the stat key. We went to the calculation menu. We chose one variable statistics. And then we told the calculator that our data was in L1. So that's the structure that you'd be following whenever you do your means and standard deviations on the calculator. Make sure that you're doing this work on problems that say um, use technology. If it says to use tables and to show your work, then you should be doing the, the work as we did on the previous pages. All right, let me go ahead and show you another one. Um, this one is an example that would work for group data. I'm going to use GPA as an example just because I think that's an interesting one for us to see um, in a college setting. But what I'm about to show you here is um, going to be for calculating the GPA. But basically what I'm going to do to make that happen is consider the units to be like the frequency on this problem. So what I'm showing you here for calculating GPA would be the same as for doing group data. It's just we're going to use the units just like we would a frequency. So let's go ahead and read the example, and I'll show you how that works on the calculator. So the table below shows the number of units earned at each letter grade for a university student. Calculate the GPA for the student. So I'm going to want to enter this data in, both the number of grade points that you earn for the uh, letter grade that you get, and then also the number of units to weight that because if you get an A in a statistics class which is four units and you get a C in your PE class which is typically one unit those don't balance out to the B if the stat class is four units it counts four times as much so we want to make sure we weight that with the units and I'll show you how to do that on the calculator before we enter in the data it's just worth noting that they listed every grade possible A, A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus and so on but this student never got a C minus, so we could go ahead and just cross that line off. They never got a D plus, so we could cross that off. They never got a D minus, so we could cross that off. 
Sadly for them, they did get an F. We can't cross those off. We're going to have to enter them in. You could punch them in with a frequency of zero and your answer would be fine, but since those grades never happened, it's not actually data in our data set, we could just leave it off and that'll be a little faster. All right, so let me show you how we would do this on the calculator. I would go back into the stat menu. So I'm going to clear out this old stuff. Press the stat key. We want to edit to enter in new data. We have still our bills from the problem up above, so I'll arrow up to highlight the list name, press clear and down arrow to erase that. And then for my data value, or you could say, let me squeeze this in, for my x's, I'm going to put the 4, the 3.7, and so on, so that's what I'm going to type in this first column. And I think if you are going to skip the ones with a frequency of zero, it's a really good idea to line them out. Otherwise, you might accidentally enter the GP, GPA value here and then um, forget to do the frequency on that side or vice versa. So if you either use them and uh, don't cross them off and use them both, or if you're going to not use them, cross them off just to make sure you don't accidentally put them in one column and not the other. And then I'm going to go over to list two, and what I'm going to put there are the units and if it was some other sort of group data problem I would put the frequencies so I'll type those in and just kind of note that I have the same length column that's just a, a good quick check that I didn't miss anything obvious and then again at this point I'm gonna let the calculator take over and do the rest of the work so I'm going to hit the stack key I'm gonna to go to calc I'm still going to do one variable statistics. I'm just this is my variable. We never treat um, frequency as if it were a variable in any group data problem. I could see an argument for saying that units are a variable, but when you're computing a GPA, you trade, treat it as a weighting value, which means it's like a frequency. So we're still going to choose one variable statistics. But we put data in both columns, so what we tell the calculators, we hit second L1, and we're saying, all right, we're doing one variable, and that's where that variable is. is L1. But then we need to get these frequencies used, so what we do is we hit the comma key down here, and then we use the second and the L2 option, and the calculator knows if you're doing one variable statistics that the first one is the variable and the second one are frequencies for that variable. So even though we do one variable stats, we enter two things, L1, which is our variable, comma L2, which is our frequencies and the comma is essential. If you don't do that, it'll multiply the two together and treat it as a single variable. We really need it to see one is the variable, one is the frequency, and that comma key right down here above the seven key. So I'll press enter, and this is gonna, again, do all the work for us. I would like to be able to check my work if I can, so one of the things is looking at the N. Notice it thinks we have 116 values, so somehow it is really counting these as if there were 7 times that we got a 3.7 and 24 times that we got a 3.0. And that's good. That's matching up with our total number of units. And then I'll slide this out of the way. Oh, here it is. I gave you a sum of the x squareds, so 738.96, 738.96, 738 that's matching, so I feel good that I don't have typos. And now I want to write down my answer. So it's an interesting question whether a GPA, which stands for grade point average, is a sample mean or a population mean. Typically you're summarizing what you've done so far as a student, uh, and so I would say you have all of your grades and you're trying to summarize them, and so I would say you're treating that as a population value. But you know, if you're transferring to another school, they're asking you for that because they're thinking of it as an estimate for what you might do in the future, so they might be looking at it as if it were sample data. It, it doesn't really matter that much when you're doing this computation though because we're not going to call it mu or x bar we're just going to call it the GPA and it's going to be the average and whether that's called x bar or mu it came from adding up all the data dividing by the total number of units which is 116 and so I'm going to say the GPA is approximately 2.31 and I'm putting two decimal places just because that's the standard that I'm used to seeing for GPA, so I think that makes sense. And yes, this was a zero, but followed by an eight, so we'd be rounding up there. And I think it also makes sense to do two decimal places here if your original data had things like 3.3, because we're supposed to put one decimal more on our averages than we had on the original data. So that fits there as well. 
And then lastly, you could ask, well, which standard deviation should I use, the S or the sigma? And I would say, well, that depends on whether you consider this to be sample data or population data. But on the other hand, it doesn't matter because we're not being asked for the standard deviation in this situation. Most of us have heard of GPA, but we haven't heard of the GPSD or something like that. So um, it's really not a concern on this one. But if you were doing some other um, type of problem where it was group data and you had frequencies and it was sample data or population data, then just pay attention to that and pick S for sample standard deviation and sigma if it was population standard deviation. And for the mean, call it X bar if it was sample data, call it mu if it was population data. And what we did here for the GPA will apply for those other group data problems that have frequencies. And I think that's pretty much it for the calculator. Hopefully that's helpful and you can review that as much as you need to to get comfortable with those calculator computations. And I think you'll enjoy making the computation that way a lot more than making the tables, which can be uh, pretty tedious at times.